Andrea Smith from the New York State Coalition for Children's Behavioral Health. Thank you for joining me. Thank you. Happy to join New York Now and keep up to date with uh, what's going on in children's mental health. Andrea, the State Education Department has formed a task force to handle reopening schools, and you're on that task force. The academic side of reopening schools, of course, is very important, but so is the behavioral and mental health of children. Right. So the State Education Department has done a fantastic job of bringing stakeholders statewide together. Um, I participated in four reopening uh, Zoom meetings with over 300 people in each meeting. And then they broke up the groups into nine subject areas. I participated in the social emotional learning subject area. And I just want to say that whatever we do for kids, um, we have to meet them where they are and we have to meet their families where they are. And for schools to know about the history of what's happened to each individual child and each family over the past, you know, six months is going to be a difficult challenge. So while they have, you know, learning challenges, transportation challenges, teaching challenges, teacher and human workforce challenges, um, trying to reconnect with the kids is what we focused on in social emotional learning. Right. How do you think the decisions that will be made and the steps that will be taken um, for reopening schools, how do you think that will affect the behavioral and mental health of children? Well, we know that children are feeling isolated. There was a recent article um, where an 18-year-old in a uh, single interview used the words fear, afraid, scared, or terrified over 18 times. Um, so we know that what has happened to kids uh, has been challenging. And so when schools reopen, we have to be able to address those basic uh, safety and well-being feelings before kids are really ready to learn. And so I think the toughest part is going to be, you know, when teaching is your profession, putting that aside until everyone's ready to learn again. And we have to be doing that from day one, uh, rebuilding trust and rebuilding relationships and, and working through anxiety before um, any learning can really occur. So budgets um, and finances are a big talking point for a lot of institutions these days. And Governor Cuomo has said without federal aid, there could be cuts to the education budget in the state. Mm -hmm. How do you think those budget cuts would affect the behavioral and mental health services that are offered to children in schools? Would that lead to the elimination of counseling positions? So there are positions inside the school and there are community-based organizations that work with children and families after school or in their homes and every resource is going to be needed to address the needs the emerging needs of children so the budget cuts cut both ways if school budgets are cut um the additional transportation to achieve social distancing is impacted the additional teachers uh, that would be needed to keep the classroom smaller so that there are fewer kids in the classroom at, at any time. And then if the community-based organizations are cut, all of the supports that we need to seamlessly keep the kids safe in, say, out-of-school time programs, after-school time programs, so they're not home alone if they're on a remote learning day, or the mental health services that go in, pushed into the schools to run a school-based mental health clinic or to train teachers about post-traumatic stress and trauma-informed learning, um, all of those resources will be impacted. So right now, uh, we are very much focused on making sure that school districts are included in federal um, economic stimulus aid because they are gonna need more money to teach 
in a socially distant appropriate way. And just like community-based organizations are going to need more money to be able to expand this number of kids uh, and serve the number of kids that are going to present as needing services. And this need for federal aid, it's gone beyond schools. It's even affected the Office of Mental Health, which has put uh, some grant funding on hold. You right. wrote a letter to Governor Cuomo, and you are asking for that, that grant money to be freed up. How much money um, are we talking about? So we're talking about a lot of money, but let me say that the governor's office uh, did notify us on Friday that the July 1st state aid to mental health providers will be released. And we are so relieved that the state budget office and the governor's office has prioritized that funding. Um, we think that it will be about $70 million that will flow into counties and therefore, and then from counties down to community-based organizations. And we did write that letter and other colleagues wrote similar letters. Um, I co-authored a letter with Families Together in New York State, which represents families and family professional family peer advocates. Um, and others wrote uh, also to the governor. And we do believe we were heard and that funding will come through. Thank goodness. Now, will that mean a full complement of services? Will that be enough to make sure all of the services that have been provided in the past will be accounted for going forward? No, I mean, that really will just allow us to um, keep the local uh, grant programs running. Most of our funding is through Medicaid, and uh, there's another federal uh, disbursement that we're waiting on. It was recently announced that the federal government was going to make $15 billion available to eligible Medicaid providers. Uh, I am training my providers on the application process. That application process continues until July 20th. Um, that's the funding that will be needed to keep services whole because um, we lost revenue as a result of COVID. While we were able to bring up telehealth and do a lot of visits, uh, the duration of the visits may not have been what was expected. The number of visits may not be comparable with what uh, last year's budgeted amounts were. Um, so therefore there will be gaps in our revenue. And then there were hundreds of thousands of dollars of additional costs to be able to do telehealth services. So we're covering a lot of ground in that answer, but we need that federal money. What other kind of assistance or guidance have you gotten from the state and federal levels? So um, the state is encouraging mental health providers to apply for any available aid through the federal government. There are local FEMA grants, uh, those are emergency assistance grants uh, that could be applied for. Um, there were uh, the pay payroll protection uh, program that some providers applied for. And then most recently there's this, this uh, provider relief fund for 15 billion that providers are being encouraged by OMH to apply for. You know, we're gonna need every cent of it. Uh, the expenses of trying to, just like I described with the schools, reduce the number of kids, uh, the staff to kid ratio so that there was less contact, the ability to quarantine kids and build out safe spaces in residential programs, um, the ability to pay essential workers hazard pay so that they you know, were incentivized to come to work when things were very dangerous uh, statewide. All of those expenses are going to have to be accounted for or the nonprofits, some of which who operate on less than 30 days of cash on hand to continue operation. And that was before COVID. You know, they're going to need these revenues to be able to continue serving the most needy. Andrea, the most important thing to talk about here, of course, is the children. How are the children who need these services, how are they doing? How are they coping with these changes? And how do you see things going for them going forward? 
So we're, we're actually pleasantly surprised that most of the kids currently in therapeutic relationships adjusted well to telepsychiatry and telehealth, that they uh, participated uh, in their meetings remotely with staff people who they trusted. And um, while there were some uh, older youth who didn't want to participate remotely and preferred to see people in fa face to face, uh, we found that older teens actually enjoyed participating, uh, a majority of them in groups and being able to have that interaction, even if it was remotely. And same with family members who were getting assistance to help them implement their children's treatment plans. If a child has a severe emotional disturbance, it affects the whole family. And in close proximity, everybody needed extra support to be able to keep children on track and keep their behaviors um, developing so that they were functioning well. And that was extremely hard for some of our families. Uh, I think that we are always amazed in the children's mental health field how families with very few resources are able to meet their children's needs um, and support them, which with much fewer resources than most people are used to. And, um, you know, we found that they needed to draw on those resources and we needed to be there to support them. So right now we're focused on preventing anything bad happening to the kids in our care, supporting the families, making sure food is in the home, making sure the visits are on track, making sure that there's a plan for recreation that is safe and reliable and just trying to help families in any way that they can identify so that kids stay on track and, and families stay together. Andrea Smith, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you.